So yes, uh, thank you to Pete, um, and also thanks to uh, everyone else um, at the Haven's Right Centre. Uh, the forthcoming uh, lectures, particularly the one on the Black Panther Party, look particularly fascinating, and I uh, hope I can uh, find the opportunity to join. For those of you who were um, at the previous lecture, you're going to recognise here that there is a great deal of continuity um, in terms of themes, particularly this notion of the void, the hollowing of democratic politics and the mutual withdrawal of uh, elites and the people from uh, politics, as articulated by uh, Peter Mayer, the political scientist. I'm also going to develop the theme, which I spoke about last time, about the various ways in which so-called populists and political entre uh, entrepreneurs have sought to fill that void uh, and to exploit its consequences uh, for their own ends. And I'll discuss my own research, which, as Pete said, is largely about the uh, politics of the 2015 so-called refugee crisis and particularly the contrast, uh, the apparent contrast that was often made at that time between the notion of uh, Europe as this liberal, open, cosmopolitan uh, formation um, and society, uh, a notion I think that's particularly prominent often in, uh, amongst people in the United States of America, particularly perhaps looking on with Donald Trump in charge and so on. But conversely, the various um, supposedly populist right uh, forces emerging from Viktor Orban in Hungary, Kaczynski in uh, Poland, some of the figures such as Marine Le Pen um, in France, Salvini in Italy, and so on, and obviously our very own uh, Brexit that represented a different um, view of the European future. And what I'm going to suggest in all of this is that the EU has legitimate, uh, legitimized itself, both by presenting itself as the enemy of this uh, right populism, and simultaneously also, though, um, by incorporating some of the themes of anti-migration sentiment uh, that many of these individuals and movements were raising. And I think in and amongst all that, what you really start to understand are the contradictions that are left by a crisis of what I'll call neoliberal globalization, a theme that was developed last time as well, and also the contradictions that we ourselves as the left sometimes encounter in terms of articulating our own responses. Just to begin with, it's worth taking a step backward um, and thinking about um, how much the EU has expanded both in terms of its geographical extent, which is kind of well captured in this graph, and also in terms of the range of different functions that it is expected to perform over the years. Much of this uh, culminating in, as I said, 2004 to 7, in the big bang of Eastern enlargement, which will become a theme as we go on. Much of the narrative presented about the EU, both by its friends and also by the enemies is this kind of theme of unstoppable progress and expansion and what would be called ever closer union. To the dreamers, very often there was the vision ultimately of achieving a fully federal Europe where the old fashioned nation state would disappear and with it the prospects of all the war and the conflict that plagued so much of 20th century history. To its enemies, this equally was the nightmare, this idea of a European super state imposing its will on the little guy um, and there being no place left for meaningful national sovereignty and so on and so forth. In truth, in no sense has this ever been the entirely uh, popular vision, whether amongst European populations who have continued to vote in European elections, largely on the basis of their own national parties and so on and so forth, but equally amongst European leaders as well, as well, who have tended to make, take a more pragmatic uh, view of trying to achieve their own national interests inside European structures. Nonetheless, there has been this idea that as things developed in small steps, Europe would continue to draw closer and closer. And academics used to speak about uh, attitudes to, be, uh, to the European Union being formed on the basis of a permissive consensus, where the people might be sort of passively accepting 
of the EU's existence, insofar as it didn't really seem to be intruding too much into their daily lives, and insofar as they expected some range of economic benefits uh, from the European project. And within that, there was the underlying optimism that with all these small steps of integration, there would be spillover effects which would eventually begin to see the erosion of national identities and for people to become uh, citizens of a sort of generalized sense of European identity and of the creation ultimately of one European people. And that's where we come to the problems um, because we've had a succession of crises that have problematized all the uh, narrative expectations that people might have had about the European future, insofar at least as people might have been optimistic about it. I talk about the Eurozone crisis here. Now, it's an interesting one because um, in many ways it continues to live with us. The social and economic after effects on Southern Europe uh, have been considerable and extraordinary in so many different ways, particularly, of course, in Greece. Equally, I think it remains the case that it's because of the Eurozone currency and its coercive impact on uh, national democracies that we're unlikely to see any progress beyond Brexit in terms of a breakup of the European Union. However, I've said that it culminates in 2015, and I say that for a reason, because 2015 is the year of the Greek referendum and of the ultimate defeat of what might be called the project of left populism, the project of resisting austerity from the left um, and presenting this vision of another European uh, Europe is possible and all these ideas that came up. After 2015, it becomes increasingly impossible to imagine a leftist route out of the crisis of the European project. Hot in the heels of that comes where my, much of my research has been recently in terms of the refugee crisis. And I'll come on to speak about that at greater length as we go on. But clearly, uh, the impact of that is uh, very suddenly to shift the dial in terms of anti-establishment resistance to the European project from being seen and problematized largely as a thing of the radical left to being increasingly seen as an aspect of the politics of the radical right, where the left often seemed to be um, in the coalition, as it were, of the status quo or the establishment in various different ways, particularly after the incorporation of Syriza. Another aspect of that is Brexit which formally speaking should have been a really difficult moment. It's the moment at which the European project loses uh, one of its biggest economic and military powers. In fact, it didn't quite work out like that um, because actually the period of Brexit is a period of respite for the European uh, Union, a period where there is an experience of a renewed sense of solidarity and togetherness that might not have appeared possible during the height of the so-called refugee crisis, particularly in 2015. But following on quickly from all that goodwill, we have the pandemic. And the pandemic has, as we will come on to discuss later, served again to reinforce the kind of endemic crisis-ridden nature of much of the European project recently. What will become apparent in all of this is that in all these intractable, intractable um, crises and problems and so on, they all tend to problematize much of what we think is people who are supportive of social justice, we consider ourselves perhaps to be on the left, in terms of what we think about borders, openness um, and democracy. Equally, there is neither a viable movement for reform uh, of European structures in, any, uh, in anything but a piecemeal fashion, or a realistic prospect of the EU doing its own type of Brexit and breaking apart. The federal dreams equally of the past are essentially um, long gone. And perhaps as uh, political scientists and international relations uh, scholars and fairness have long predicted, what has emerged of the EU is essentially an intergovernmental uh, meeting ground 
essentially trying to engineer consensus between broadly centre-right national leaderships with some exceptions, um, bolted on to which we have the single currency and all its problems, a human rights agenda, um, and of course the European Parliament, which does not possess its own powers to initiate legislation. Um, briefly, I just want to kind of go on to my um, themes of my own research. Uh, our book is kind of looking at the um, ways in which the refugee crisis, as it was imagined in 2015, many of you will remember the uh, pictures of the little refugee boy, Alan Curdy, and um, a, a great deal of humanitarian outpouring at the time, but also some really stern anti-migration narratives and so on. And what we examined was how all of this was leading people to reimagine what Europe was about and what its future might be. Much of that research concentrated, as I've hinted at the start, on Eastern Europe, where you've had um, governments actively styling themselves as being illiberal Democrats who have been, uh, you know, um, attacking minority communities, um, Jewish people, immigrants, um, LGBT communities, and so on and so forth. And who have been uh, more significantly for our own purposes, reimagining uh, what the European project is supposed to be about in their own terms. This idea emerges then of this European civilization that is white, Christian, um, and under threat from migration, principally, of course, from uh, the uh, Muslim majority world. And this has resonance beyond uh, the particular governments, of course, of Hungary and Poland and so on, uh, that have uh, come to power around these narratives, but also is reflected in some of the populist right opposition parties, some of which have also had a taste of government power um, in more established European states, such as Italy. And all of that presents an apparent contrast with the EU's own vision of itself as this kind of open society of freedom of movement, everyone welcome, and so on and so forth what Jeremy Rifkin once saw as the European dream in contrast to the degraded vision of the American dream and all these other things. However, the main conclusion of our book was that there is not an easy way uh, to make very obvious contrast between these kind of like radical right and liberal uh, visions of Europe. And part of the reason for that, you can see in the top uh, part of the slide here, uh, on the top right, where you'll see an appointee to the recent European Commission, who is tasked with dealing with questions of migration under the banner of protecting the European way of life, which immediately raised questions about what is this European way of life and who or what uh, is threatening it. There was a great deal of controversy about this at the time, in fairness, um, some of it from the left, accusing the uh, European Commission of having incorporated the narratives of the populist right. Also from the populist right itself, congratulating the European Commission uh, for precisely the same reason. Now, you can call this a, an error of marketing. It was eventually amended to become promoting the European way of life. You can call it an anomaly, but I'm, I'm not entirely convinced of that because in reality, an element of fortress Europe has always been the continent's dirty secret for some time. And there is an element of which there's a logical connection between breaking down barriers internally and putting them up externally. It's sobering to realize that since 1989, the EU and Schengen area states have constructed an estimated thousand kilometers of land walls equivalent to six Berlin walls, largely in an effort to stop the flight of forcibly displaced people. There are also significant sea barriers um, and uh, a recent estimation of deaths by drowning in the Mediterranean put that figure at 20,000 people. All of this raises big questions, I think, about what the left is trying to achieve in terms of our relationship to globalization and more recently with 2008 and the coronavirus and so on, what might be called the collapse of neoliberal globalization. 
And in our book, we've explored three uh, core themes. Uh, the first one is a bit of a mouthful, um, and I apologize that, but basically by cosmopolitanism, um, what I mean is this notion that the world is or is becoming or should be a single moral community rather than being divided into individual nation states and so on as it has been in the past. It's often a politically con a contentious idea. I mean, at the most extreme, you might think of Joseph Stalin in the 50s and the purge against uh, Jewish people on the basis of them being ruthless uh, cosmopolitans and so on. More recently, you might think of our former British Prime Minister, um, Theresa May, uh, attacking citizens of nowhere. In academic thinking, I think, by contrast, you get pretty much the opposite bias, particularly amongst theorists of the third way and the centre-left, such as Anthony Giddens, Ulrich Beck, um, and to a lesser extent, Jürgen Habermas. There's this idea that cosmopolitanism is not just uh, a sign of the intrinsic worth of a person, but perhaps the sole ambition of progressive politics. And many leftists have seen this as the core reason why they support the European Union as a sort of stance against the horrors of European history, of nationalism, and so on and so forth. And that prejudice, I think, is something that I want to examine a bit more closely and to problematize. Because apart from anything else, cosmopolitanism has not only been all these positive things that people might like to speak of, but has also been the rationale for imperialism and for empire, and even for the rights of supposedly superior uh, civilizations to transform the world in their own image. Most recently, you might think of the American, UK, and others with their invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, and the whole project of the war on terror and neoconservatism. You'll also see pictured here Davos. And clearly there is an element of the elite, globally speaking, that does see that being cosmopolitan in some way or other makes you a superior human being. And it's part of the contemporary ideology, if you like, of the capitalist Superman, which also plays a big role in Silicon Valley and all these other things. And it can be a very convenient ideology um, for some of these super rich people, because it kind of tells you that by making philanthropic bequests to humanitarian causes and so on, you can forget about your obligations to pay taxes in your national state, to pay your workers properly in those states and so on and so forth. Therefore, I think, you know, uh, part of what I want to do, and I'll discuss this later, is to draw some contrast between what I see as the internationalist tradition uh, and the cosmopolitan tradition as they apply to the left, and to present a certain ambivalence uh, around that concept. Very often, the opposite of what is presented as cosmopolitan is sovereignty. And obviously, that's something I discussed a lot um, on Tuesday. Uh, it's something that should be considered, I think, to have two different dimensions. The most commonly talked about one is what's called national sovereignty, the right of nations to decide their interests without external interference. But there's also what I mentioned on Tuesday in relation to Peter Mayer, this notion of the people being sovereign. And the EU has often been seen as the epitome, including by Mayer, of politics without the people and thus what may are called the hollowing of democracy. So the basic point to remember is that sovereignty is not just about national autonomy, it's also about state power and politicians owing their power to the people. Um, lastly, there's this question of populism and very often the European Union has framed populism as being the problem in Europe, as being the enemy and so on and so forth. Equally, as I've stressed, many of the uh, aspects uh, and probably more morally troubling aspects of right populism have started to enter the bloodstream, not just of centrist politicians like Macron with his attacks on the Muslim community and so on, but also even of the most supranational institutions of the European uh, project. Equally, much of the case against populism, particularly between 2009 and 15, was ranged against the anti-cuts agenda of the left. 
So what I'm trying to emphasize in all this is the European Union is central to all the big conceptual debates the left and progressives more broadly need to have about globalization um, and particularly this notion of globalization under threat. All of which is particularly important when we consider this angle of neoliberalism, the free market ideology that has prevailed across um, much of the world for the last four decades. It's an uncomfortable fact, both for Brexiteer Tories and for liberal Europhiles everywhere, that the single market was in many respects a British Thatchery creation. You see pictured here uh, Lord Caulfield. Um, he was appointed by Thatcher uh, as the, um, the uh, British representative of the uh, European, uh, to the European Commission, largely to undertake a project, um, sorry, that's a cat, um, largely to undertake a project uh, of um, cutting regulation through the mechanism of a common market. And he's widely considered to be the uh, father of the single market. You can see his book on that very topic uh, pictured here. I have a copy myself. Now, eventually, Caulfield would run into uh, some tensions with Thatcher, if not outright to blows. And I think there is an important contrast between their varying visions of neoliberalism that kind of bears out a lot of what ultimately happens with the European Union. Both of them, of course, were opposed to trade unions, social democracy, um, regulation, um, nationalization, and all these other things. But Thatcher was of the view that she could build a popular consensus around the, co the concept of free markets by combining it with various attacks on uh, minority communities, um, on uh, immigrants, on people of color, um, on single mothers, uh, on youth culture, and so on and so forth. Rather like Reagan, a very broad umbrella of conservative causes with the free market at its center. By contrast, Caulfield was of the view, and I'm going to think that history bore him out, that the best way to impose market discipline uh, is to do it through a legalistic order, permanently separating uh, economic questions and questions of economic sovereignty from any answerability to an electorate who might be of varying temper, at one stage wanting lower taxes and lower regulation, the next minute deciding that they want something else. The ultimate question here is how does neoliberalism get its consent? Because throughout most of recent history, we've been moving in a neoliberal direction, but in fact, most of the population, uh, and Britain is a core example of this, has been reluctant about the free market, um, and that's measurable with uh, public opinion surveys and so on. And obviously with Reagan and Thatcher, you have the attempt to create uh, that kind of radical conservative coalition. But you also, I think in the 1990s and 2000s, epitomized by the European project, had this engineering of a sense that there is ultimately no alternative, that the world is becoming too complex, that people can't possibly understand all the big economic, legal and technocratic forces of the world. Um, and that they need to be insulated from them and from any tendency towards social democracy. Just talking of questions of democratic legitimacy, there is probably an aspect of which people think, and it's not entirely wrong, that there was a kind of permissive consensus surrounding the European Union um, when it came to the politics of Europe before 2008. There is some truth to that. I mean, there definitely is. Um, but I also want to problematize it a little bit by pointing out that whenever there was referendums on uh, European integration, the project was always dicing with death. There was, in 1992, the Danish rejection of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, subsequently overturned. Norway rejected membership. Ireland in 2001 rejected the Treaty of Nice, uh, Denmark and Sweden with the rejection of the Euro, the rejection of the European Constitution in 2005, equally significant. And this was a kind of complex mixture of things that were going on across the continent at the time. 
many of you um, and myself included may have participated in the anti-globalization leftism of the time, epitomized in the politics of Chomsky and Stiglitz and all of these kind of other things. <clears throat> you also had a sovereigntist backlash against globalization and some anti-migrant sentiment and so on. So there was all these complex coalitions that would sometimes form against European integration at various times, even before 2008. But things accelerate drastically um, after the financial crisis. Austerity obviously was a feature of politics everywhere. Uh, Northern Europe and its most prosperous parts were really no exception in many regards. Nonetheless, what happened to Southern Europe was extraordinary, particularly those so-called pigs, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, uh, Greece, and Spain. Of course, it wasn't entirely unprecedented if you'd read your Stiglitz or whatever it was, and you'd read about what happened to Africa, um, the African continent, Latin America, Asia, and so on, and the uh, vast structural adjustment programs imposed on those societies and those governments by the International Monetary Fund, obviously with limited democratic legitimacy and so on, with often disastrous economic consequences, social consequences for the long term and so on, and you're probably perfectly aware of that. Nonetheless, there was a sort of naive expectation, I would think, that in the global north, we were relatively insulated from many of these forces. And that's why what the so-called Troika did to the countries of Southern Europe, and particularly to, uh, to Greece, was so extraordinary. Um, the vast privatizations that were imposed, uh, vast cuts in social spending, vast cuts in wages, and so on. And what they were doing to the economy and to society also needs to run up against what was going on with politics. In one week, I believe, you had two technocratic governments with economics professors being imposed simultaneously in Greece and in Italy in order to impose austerity because national governments were no longer willing to do so. The resistance to this was generally speaking, there are exceptions such as Silvio Berlusconi, what a guy he was, um, but the general expectation at the time was that this was being resisted by a sort of left-wing populist current. Syriza, Podemos, um, and so on were explicitly left populist, uh, explicitly committed to using a methodology they had taken from Ernesto Leclerc, focused on contrasting the uh, corrupted elite with the virtuous people and all these other things. You may remember slogans such as real democracy now and so on. The crucial point I want to emphasize is that by 2015, the possibility of a left populist or progressive answer to the crisis of European austerity had been essentially snuffed out. Central to that was uh, Syriza and Tsipras's ultimately naive hope that either the Greek people would capitulate to the austerity demands of the Troika, which they did not do in the referendum, or else that the Troika would capitulate to the demands of the people as expressed in the referendum, which didn't happen either. It's important to remember though, that the first panic about Eurosceptic populism uh, that ran through European politics was largely at the time framed as a panic about the radical left. And I think it's partly the failure of the radical left, or if some may prefer, the deliberate crushing of the radical left that sets up much of the politics of the period to come. And that's the period that I've uh, kind of focused on in some of my own research, um, the so-called refugee crisis, which reaches its peak in 2015, um, around about the same time. That exposes huge uh, cleavages in the European continent, geographical, cultural, economic, and so on. I've spoken a bit about Eastern Europe um, and the figures of Viktor Orban, in Hungary um, and Kaczynski in Poland and the accusations of democratic backsliding and illiberal democracy and all the other things uh, that come with their attacks on Jewish people, LGBT minorities and all these other things. There's also the politics here of Southern Europe, having been plagued by all these austerity measures, they're also the centerpiece of uh, many of problems and contradictions that come with the flight 
of displaced people, particularly from the uh, Syrian civil war, but from other aspects of the post Arab Spring environment as well. Generally speaking, at this time, there's an idea that we need to deal with this on the basis of solidarity. Crucially, this is not solidarity of the European people to all these people who are fleeing these conflicts. It's really what was meant by solidarity at the time, uh, as officially formulated, is largely something to do with distributing all the burdens, as perceived, of these people coming here between different European countries, which ultimately ends in failure. Um, and in various uh, deals with uh, the likes of Turkey for the externalization of the uh, management of refugees and so on. What you also see at this time is that there is no um, another Europe is possible style leftist humanitarian narrative really. What you essentially have is the status quo and the mainstream sort of struggling to deal with all the consequences um, with the left uh, such as Cypras, essentially falling in behind with occasional complaints, versus the European uh, right, which is imposing an idea of Europe as a white Christian civilization, um, and so on, threatened by all these people and the forces coming here. Some of this presented, of course, as a Jewish conspiracy to bring lots of Muslim people to Europe, um, regardless of how absurd some of that may sound. So right populism essentially is resurgent. The left essentially has been rendered dead in the water um, and the center is struggling to deal with uh, many of the consequences. Out of all that, you also get Brexit, um, which in some ways can be seen as on the spectrum of continuity, more generally with the migration crisis, as so-called. Of course, this slogan of take back control has a far broader meaning than just the question of migration. But even if you consider that, there were aspects of the Brexit campaign that were very directly uh, reflecting on some of those themes of uh, refugees and Europe's supposed culpability before them. So, for instance, Nigel Farage, who many of you will know as the populist leader, um, of the uh, of United Kingdom Independence Party and the Brexit Party and so on. He released a poster that was showing a caravan of non-white people coming to the European continent in rags and probably coming here to take your job or whatever it happens to be. So definitely there is an aspect of continuity here uh, with the narrative of the populist right. But it's also the point of a termination of the populist right as being, of having a serious agenda of Euroscepticism. Around this time, uh, Salvini, Le Pen, um, and various other uh, leading figures of the European populist right essentially drop their commitment to leaving either the European Union or the Eurozone because it was becoming um, seen as unviable given all the problems that Britain was encountering. You have to remember that Britain had serious advantages. Obviously, it's a relatively rich, relatively big state and all these other things. But most of all, it wasn't a member of the Eurozone. And the Eurozone, despite the fact it's a dysfunctional mess, does impose a certain coercive uh, aspect because ultimately Greece and others were left with a situation where you would bankrupt yourself by leaving the Europe, uh, Europe structures and you just had to take that risk. Of course, that risk was taken by, say, Argentina in the past and so on, but nonetheless, it's something that you would never gain an electoral majority for. So this is actually a moment of a crisis of the populist right and of a revival of an idea of European togetherness that might well have seemed impossible around the period of, break, uh, of the so-called refugee crisis and so on. The biggest measure of that, perhaps, is the European Parliament elections of 2019. Since the Parliament was formed in 79, there had been almost continuously declining electoral turnout. In the 2019 election, you see a surge, um, I believe, of 8% um, in voter turnout, driven partly by populist right voters themselves, but actually much of the evidence suggests that it was uh, voters of the Liberal Centre, young people, um, green voters. Sadly, I'm afraid for 
individuals such as myself, not voters of the radical left, but um, it was a vote uh, inspired in part by opposition to the populist right. So there's a great deal of goodwill that has been uh, built up paradoxically by the spectre of one of Europe's most powerful states leaving. Just as a side note though, um, there's a risk of British exceptionalism here because in reality aspects of this crisis didn't end. Um, putting aside uh, the um, states I've mentioned of Hungary, Poland and all of their different contra uh, contradictions on the European periphery, there are central European liberal states uh, that were imposing vast repressions on parts of their own population. You can think, for instance, of the Spanish state in Catalonia uh, repressing the referendum, or of Macron, perhaps the most Europhile of contemporary European leaders, um, imposing vast repression on the Gilets jaunes protests and so on. Um, there was obviously terrible events of violence in Britain as well, uh, most memorably the tragic murder of Joe Cox, the MP for the Labour Party. But nonetheless, uh, the extraordinary scale of um, violent repression on Europe never really ceased, um, despite uh, the goodwill that surrounded um, the togetherness in opposition to uh, Brexit. Just lastly, of course, uh, we've encountered the coronavirus recently, and theoretically, this should have been a point of European revival as well. Populist leaders worldwide have been absolutely decimated uh, by the coronavirus crisis. You may think of Bolsonaro in Brazil and all the problems he's encountered. You may think of Donald Trump and the radical mishandling that he made um, of the pandemic. You may think of the initial blundering of Boris Johnson um, in the United Kingdom and so on and so forth. It's been a very difficult period for right-wing populism. It's also been a period where, you know, opposition to experts um, and the technocracy and so on seems to have abated. Um, you have uh, medical experts being seen as heroes, uh, being held up by the likes of Boris Johnson even, uh, as authority figures and so on and so forth. So this should have been a point where the European Union, a uh, quintessentially technocratic, if you like, institution, had its revival, <coughs> pardon me. But clearly that's not what we've seen. I mean, Brexit has been no picnic um, in the United Kingdom. I think we can safely say that. But nonetheless, it has allowed for a relatively successful uh, vaccination program. By contrast, the ongoing um, neoliberal, uh, I would argue, prejudices of the EU um, and the procurement program under von der Leyen has been something of a disaster. Um, and essentially, we're back in a situation of having to rethink the European project as being in this perpetual state of crisis uh, now for more than a decade. Obviously, there is little evidence that anyone is going to follow uh, Britain's road. But as I've said, this is largely due to the um, coercive impact of having to belong to the Eurozone crisis um, and so on, because there's obviously vast discontents uh, that have emerged in countries such as Italy. Just to conclude with some questions about what it is we mean uh, by internationalism, by solidarity and so on. That question of solidarity was raised in relation to uh, the refugee crisis. Um, as I said, it was largely a self-interested notion, but it's something that we have to obviously think about as an independent left, um, as a progressive factor in society and so on. I've also contrasted here internationalism against cosmopolitanism and internationalism against the EU. And to explain what that might mean, we need to think back to that initial phase where the problem was left populism and its opposition to austerity. At that time, you had these various international institutions, IMF, the European Central Bank and so on, trying to impose essentially undemocratic austerity measures onto national democracies. For me, in retrospect, the truly democratic and internationalist thing to do would have been for those of us who were against austerity in other countries, 
whether Scotland, uh, whether America, uh, but also whether all the other European countries to have marched on the European Union, the European Central Bank, <coughs> and so on and so forth. Pictured here is uh, Yanis Varoufakis, and he's a kind of fascinating figure because in all of that crisis, he was the Greek finance minister. And he is one of the most lucid and perceptive critics of the European Union uh, and its bureaucracy and uh, its uh, addiction to neoliberal solutions over the past period. And his books are well worth reading. And yet his project has been to save the European Union from itself. And the kind of gamble that Varoufakis makes, and I'm not going to answer whether it's legitimate or not, um, is to say, well, the nation state, essentially small states, particularly such as Greece, are unable to stand up to the might of the various forces of globalization. Therefore, we need to raise the level of the left to the level of the European project itself. The problem I think that Varoufakis encountered though, was that in trying to do this, you really do have to go through the individual countries and their various uh, party structures and so on. His attempt to stand candidates across the European uh, community on the basis of a Europe-wide solution didn't work out particularly well, even though he's my, one of the most credible um, figures that the internationalist left could really field. And that, I think, says something about the prospects for any such project. <clears throat> it does continue to be the case that voters in European parliamentary elections tend to vote largely for domestic parties um, on the basis of their satisfaction very often with domestic governments. And there are reasons for that. Just lastly, uh, and this is the very last thing, is these questions of democracy. Now, in one hand, I think it's unfair to label the EU as undemocratic. I mean, if you compare it to any other kind of international treaty, a NAFTA or whatever you want, it is obviously significantly more democratic than any of these other things. It's also, though, undemocratic if you compare it to a national parliament for all the problems that national parliamentary democracy obviously has. There is another aspect to it, though, which might be part of the critique, which has been made by the likes of Chris Bickerton um, and other scholars in the past, which is to say that in top of being un undemocratic, it may also be anti-democratic, which is to say that it helps to erode democratic structures where they exist at the national level. This brings us back to the questions Peter Mayer raised about this void this hollowing of democracy, this uh, mutual withdrawal of people and elites, democracy without the demos, politics without the people, and all these other notions. And in all this, I'm not a nationalist myself, um, and I don't think nationalism should form part of the component of progressive politics. If for no other reason than the fact that I think we're, there is no point in the left trying to win a bargaining game with the right, when it comes to national identity. We're always going to lose any such competition when it comes down to it. But there is a basic problem, I think, which is that democracy at the national level is something that was hard won against the will of elites. It wasn't necessarily, uh, although in some cases it was handed down from high, but in all those cases, democracy, democracy tends to run into problems. Um, now, I don't think that that's just a peripheral uh, consideration. In fact, I think it's part of the essence of democracy that it is one um, and it is meaningful when it is exerted against the will of people in power, um, of elite forces in society and so on. And thus, what I want to conclude by saying is that the EU raises question of how much the left values democracy, whether we're willing to contemplate alternatives to majoritarian institutions at the national level um, and so on and ultimately in that what it is that we value about democracy and other things that we care about such as internationalism, solidarity and social justice. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, James, for that fascinating talk. We now have plenty of time for uh, questions uh, and discussion. Uh, so I would invite you all to uh, uh, think about a question to ask James or, or, or a comment or something like that. So what you do to ask a question, there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. The first one is that you can virtually raise your hand. So at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar, there should be a button that says reactions. It has a, a, a little smiling face emoji. Uh, there, if you click on that, there's an option to raise hand. Uh, I'll then see you and uh, take you. You can also, if you would rather not ask the question yourself, you're welcome to chat, uh, to type a question into the chat, in which case uh, I will read it out on your behalf. And alternatively, if you don't fancy either of those, if you switch on your video uh, and wave your hand at me, hopefully I will also see you. And I'll try and take uh, three questions uh, at a time. Uh, for James to answer. So, if you have a question or a comment, please raise your hand now. I'm definitely going to do that thing where I wait for someone to break the inevitable awkward silence here. So, hopefully someone will be the first question. Ah, we've got one in the chat. Fantastic. Thank you. This is from Mark Bourne. Does James think that Brexit has increased the risks of Scottish independence? Uh, so James, given that we don't have an, uh, any other questions just now, I'll invite you to ask that and I will hope that some other people will raise their hand in the intervening time. Um, apologies, because I thought I'd have time to eat a throat sweet while, um, uh, while that was happening. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, for me, it's maybe not best framed as a risk. In some ways, it's also framed as an opportunity. Um, I might be saying that as an overly patriotic Scot, though, you know. Um, but uh, has it, well, I mean, superficially it has in the sense that support has increased on the basis that there is huge discontent in Scotland with Brexit. Some of that has been proved to be relatively soft um, and... We've thus gone from polls that were recently showing support for independence in Scotland at 58%, down to where it's now been, I've seen it as low as 48, as high as 52 recently, um, but where it's about the level of about 50%. And I think part of the reason for that is basically that a lot of the recent support won for independence was on the basis of disaster scenarios surrounding Brexit, and it hasn't quite been the disaster that many people might have forecasted, or rather the European Union has found itself in its own disaster, which makes Brexit maybe look comparatively uh, better by comparison. There's also a kind of set of difficulties in all of this in a more philosophical level for uh, Scottish nationalism or the independence cause and so on. If you look back to the first time when the SNP turned from being against the European project to being for the European project directly. The defence of that was really that it would make it easier to access the English market. And the English market is basically the biggest market that Scotland has. The single market essentially um, facilitated the fact that even if there were two independent entities, because we would both be in the European project, uh, we would be able to trade freely with England and with the rest of the United Kingdom and so on. Now, there are a number of complications that come with Brexit in relation to those trading arrangements. And it's possible, by some people's estimation, that Brexit might make it actually, uh, or rather that um, Scotland, if it was independent, by being a member of the European Union, we might actually make our trade with the European Union, uh, sorry, with the rest of the United Kingdom, um, more difficult, um, and it might actually present a barrier. Some people have even raised the prospect of a hard border between England and Scotland, if that were the case. So there's a number of logistical things there. I'm not saying that they're insurmountable, but I'm just saying that the leadership of the SNP has yet to provide a fully coherent response to some of these big uh, logistical and intellectual challenges that have been raised by Brexit. Thanks very much, James. That was great. So we've got a few other questions in the chat. Uh, firstly, uh, Mark, in relation to the previous question, said that he didn't actually mean risk. Uh, uh, 
uh, but more likelihood. So just to, to clarify that one. Anyway, here's a sort of statement and question from uh, WEC. The EU is constructed to protect and foster the development of its members and their peoples, but never as an entity with the ambition to save the world. While there's a, a clearly a serious humanitarian crisis in the Middle East, given that the crisis in this region was largely the result of UK and US adventurism in the Middle East, why should the EU be expected to be the main recipient of refugees uh, from this region? Uh, we also have a question from Andrew. Uh, he says, excellent talk, but I disagree with the conclusion. Socialists like James Connolly and Ho Chi Minh had no problem combining the social struggle with the national struggle. How does James uh, explain this? And this isn't actually a question, but I think it draws out a question. Uh, so this is the third one. Uh, and Lynn asks, um, I'm not sure that the elites or the, the state, not sure that the elites have withdrawn from politics. I think they are just running the show through their corporate power and threats to nation states. Now, the question of withdrawal comes back to, you know, I think that uh, this comes from what when you were talking about Peter Mayer's concept of the void. So perhaps you could just elaborate on actually what you mean by withdrawal in that case, or is it uh, closer to what Lynn was saying? So those are three questions for you. I may have to ask you to repeat the third one because I didn't quite uh, catch the entire gist of that. Um, I think the first question, uh, I actually agree with it in a sort of moral sense in some ways. I mean, um, I, in some ways, the Syrian one's a bit more complex um, to lay entirely at the door of US-UK foreign policy, but I think the general point is well made. Having said that, it's not really grasping with the actual practicalities of the problem in some ways, because the fact is that regardless of what the rights and wrongs of it are, if you've got people who are fleeing and who are turning up in Greece or Italy or whatever it happens to be, obviously that then raises a bunch of logistical challenges and also legal challenges for the European project in relation to its mechanisms uh, for distributing the so-called burden of the refugee problem. The legally, I mean things like the Dublin arrangement and all these types of things. Um, so like it, the, the, the ultimate morality of it, you might well be uh, at least partially correct about that, um, but that doesn't change the fact that it ultimately proved a very difficult crisis to manage within the structures of the European Union, which ultimately ended up um, inflaming some of that populist right sentiment, partly, as I said, I think because the left, the radical left, had been so uh, much snuffed out by that point and could not present its own, as it were, humanitarian narrative. Now, as to uh, the question, I, I don't disagree in relation to uh, James Connolly and Ho Chi Minh and, uh, and all the rest of it in a sense. I mean, I think you can combine social and national uh, struggles. Um, uh, now, in fact, that's kind of, in, in some ways, partly what I've been saying um, throughout in the whole concept of popular uh, sovereignty, which I've been saying that, like, for all its flaws, we should potentially engage with um, at times, um, and of the ultimate answerability of the state to the people, which has been founded largely at a national level. Um, I... Uh, you know, the basic point I make about democracy is that democracy um, is important at a national level because it was hard won there. Right? And where democracy isn't hard won, you have to be suspicious of how democratic it really is in some ways. Um, that is the kind of main point that I would make in relation to democracy. I can't remember who said this. I, I, it's attributed to, I think, to Danton or someone, but it's like something like, the only rights worth having are those that you can defend. Like, and um, it's kind of another version of that same thesis. Um, I, I, as I said, I didn't quite understand the way that you put the third question. So if you could repeat that. So uh, it wasn't actually a question in the chat, uh, but Lynn said that um, they're not quite sure that elites have withdrawn from politics. And so I think this comes back to the point you were making about Mayor's thesis on the void, that both the people and the elites withdraw from politics. So I'm really just asking you to elaborate on that. What do you like? OK, right. have the elites really withdrawn from politics? What does that mean? So, I mean, uh, I think it's what, what do they retreat into? Like, it's like a world essentially without um, politicians meaningfully representing different social interests or competing ideologies. For me, it's like best epitomized by, although this came after the period of the maximum void, 
But I think the best epitome of it is Hillary Clinton in 2016, where she kept insisting, not that she represented anything in particular, but that she had the best credentials of any presidential candidate that had ever existed and so on and so forth. Now, we can understand what she made there. I mean, she was possibly trying to challenge a patriarchal assumption that she was incompetent or whatever it was, perhaps. But nonetheless, it kind of epitomizes the, the nature of politics as being this thing that is about saying, I am the best manager, like, and that all other things essentially have collapsed in meaning. But I would say that since 2008, partly because of populism and partly in reaction to populism, there is an extent of repoliticization that has gone on since then, um, but always measured by the fact of two things, which is firstly, that populists themselves compete on a hollow basis because society has been hollowed out. And secondly, I think it's always the tendency of the centrists that they want to return to being managers, right? Even when they've had to temporarily enter the political fray again, they want to return to the managerial approach. And much of the left ends up backing them up, um, if only out of terror of the populist right or whatever it happens to be. Now, whether that assessment is incorrect or correct, it's, uh, I think that's the way that a lot of politics has played out recently. Thanks very much, James. OK, um, I have a couple of questions in the chat and I also have Morgan uh, indicating that they'd like to speak. So I will ask you to uh, unmute Morgan uh, and ask your question. Also, if you could turn on your video, if that's possible, that would be fantastic as well. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Awesome. Uh, this is a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed Tuesday as well. Big fan. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak more to um, the racialized component that seems to be like an undercurrent here. Um, clearly, I'm American, so I'm not trying to transpose our context onto the European um, reality, but there seems to be in the context of the, the crises, either 2015, the pandemic, what have you, this, um, this racialized undercurrent of you know, maybe one could say tying national identity to a racial identity or to an ethnic identity. Uh, and, you know, that we see that throughout Central and Eastern Europe with Hungary, Poland, Russia, so on and so forth. So wondering if you could speak to that uh, specifically how and if it's used or weaponized by the left or the right uh, in your statement at the end when you were saying that the left shouldn't use nationalism. I'm wondering if you could tie that together. Thanks very much, Morgan. Uh, I'll just read out a couple of uh, questions in the chat and then I'll let James get to all of those. So the first one is from Lisa and Lisa uh, mentions that the mainstream centre left parties in Scotland seem to assume broad support for EU membership on liberal grounds, uh, freedom of movement when, within Europe uh, and so on. Uh, how could you best counter this overly simplified narrative? And then Pablo uh, says, wonder if James could briefly comment on the largely sidelined Europe of the regions concept and Bruce uh, Milan's role in its implementation within the Delo uh, Dolores Commission. The background question being whether another EU may still be possible or not. So those are three questions for you, James. And uh, please feel free to ask if you want a reminder about any of them. The uh, firstly, in terms of the um, Europe of the regions, um, I mean, it's a notion I think that's been exceptionally problematized uh, by the events, really particularly of the last um, ten years, and thus I think it's kind of fallen from fashion in some respects. Um, if I could just obviously articulate a few different cases that I've kind of mentioned in passing before. Um, there's obviously the, uh, it is obviously a, a national issue, right, of the crushing of what the Greek um, uh, referendum and so on. But basically what was going on there very often was that far from the cosmopolitan structures of Europe facilitating the democratic advancement of the smaller states, um, as it were, what it was doing really was imposing the will of German capital, French banks, and so on, um, on these vulnerable democracies. I think that was exacerbated to some extent um, by uh, the um, what the, by events in Catalonia, um, where it became entirely clear and evident 
that the EU was always going to back up the Spanish state, no matter the level of repression that was meted out um, against the uh, against the Catalan people when they tried to um, uh, assert their right to self-determination. And all of that together, I think, has led to this, the basic underlying notion that having this big market space with these big cosmopolitan institutions and so on would ultimately to be to the advantage of these uh, smaller regions and all these other things has been under threat. Probably the biggest moment at which it has been reasserted would be the defence of Ireland over the um, over the uh, uh, Brexit negotiations and so on. But I think they were partly so vicious in prosecuting some of these questions, precisely out of a sense of latent guilt that Europe had been acting so much in the interests of big German capital and so on, and was seen to have been doing that um, for such a long time. Um, that, uh, yeah, I think that probably that explains a lot of the behaviour in the Brexit negotiations that occurred between 2016 and 2019. In relation to the Scottish centre-left uh, that Lisa asked, um, uh, I wish I kind of knew, but I think the important contrast to draw here is as follows. 38% of Scotland uh, voted um, against the, EU, the European Union, um, which I think is a flawed figure, in the sense that I think if it was a matter of Scotland, rather than a question of, you know, Westminster and the Tories, um, the figure would have been considerably closer. Um, there is a difference there. But nonetheless, let's just take that 38% of people who voted against EU membership. That needs to be contrasted with the fact that there were basically no institutions, almost no politicians, um, or anything else in Scotland, that were in favour of Brexit or of, um, a, of any type of critical perspective on the European Union full stop. Now, I'm not saying that Brexit is correct or anything like that in any of that. I'm just saying if you understand that contrast, you understand that the debate isn't fully played out in Scotland. Um, and I think if you were to have Scotland leaving the United Kingdom, you would probably have a more serious debate to be had, particularly because of the logistical problems that I've identified in terms of um, how you would uh, relate to the British economy um, after Brexit under the circumstances that you're in the single market. Morgan, uh, thank you so much firstly for your overly generous comments uh, about uh, my presentation, um, but thank you for that. Um, in relation to the racial uh, dynamics, of course, um, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, one of the things I like to emphasize about it is as follows. The notion, and this goes back to a previous comment that was made, a lot of these Islamophobic notions and stereotypes that have inspired the populist right, you have to remember that they come from archetypally, uh, you know, centrist cosmopolitan politicians initially. Like, uh, so the likes of Tony Blair, um, the likes of uh, the project for the new American century, that aspect of American history and, and so on and so forth. Remembering, of course, that many of these Bush figures have been rehabilitated uh, by liberals um, in America and so on. So um, there is definitely a racialization, particularly of the Muslim other that goes on, um, uh, particularly in, I mean, in governmental terms, particularly, as you see, in uh, Hungary uh, and Poland. But soft Islamophobia is central to endless agendas and is still part of centrist agendas today in much of Europe as well. I mean, there was obviously a very awful uh, situation with the beheading in France, but Macron's uh, reaction was predictably repressive and predictably uh, Islamophobic in scope. So um, there is a significant difference, I think, um, in the sense that the racial dynamic in Europe is largely still framed around this idea of uh, the Muslim other. Um, and uh, that in and of itself is one of the baleful legacies of the war on terror, which was imposed by the political establishment, of course, at the time. Many of the European leading, uh, leading figures, of course, being honorable exceptions, I'm going to grant that, you have to accept the degree of com uh, complexity there, that uh, Gerhard Schroeder, um, Jack Chirac and so on, were resistant to it, 
but nonetheless, uh, yeah, we're still living with um, the awful uh, consequences of Islamophobia in Europe, and it's central to a number of government agendas. Just following on from Morgan's question, you've talked very much about the Muslim other. What about the racialization of peoples from Eastern Europe? Could you also maybe talk about that? No, I mean, that, that's a fascinating question, which I really should have addressed. I mean, because it's an interesting one, that the way that the populist writers have to pivot and relate to this problem, because... Um, Previously, like uh, when there was the first stirrings of the populist right, much of it was against um, the prospect of Eastern European migration and so on. Um, the fascinating pivot that kind of happens um, in and around the so-called refugee crisis is that you have this coming together of the populist right in East and West, um, sometimes explicitly. Uh, undertaking uh, the same project and asserting a similar ideological uh, um, agenda, which is just kind of fascinating on the basis that you did, of course, have the populist right in the West, uh, firstly asserting itself against the peoples of Eastern Europe um, and their right to, uh, to come to Western Europe, which some of these Eastern European governments had had to defend in the first place. Um, so, yeah, it's just a kind of fascinating historical contradiction there. But they've both been able to uh, build a similar agenda um, based on that. Uh, I think one set of racializations kind of erased the other, like in terms of their um, focus. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the, for instance, the Brexit uh, propaganda from Nigel Farage and others wasn't so much focused on Eastern European uh, migration but on pictures of caravans of, you know, non-white people coming here and all of these other things, much of which had nothing to do, generally speaking, with the European Union. Um, I mean, I remember um, the, the reason I didn't vote for Brexit, um, and this is a very personal story, really, but uh, I, I would potentially have voted for it on the basis of what happened to Greece. And I went up to the one stall I ever saw um, about Brexit um, in the city centre, uh, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely considering voting uh, with you. And the man just spent about 15 minutes. He would not let me get a word in edgeways. And he just kept banging on about uh, sub-Saharan Africans that were coming over here and spreading AIDS and all this sort of crap, right? Um, and at that point, I said, I can't vote with this idiot, right? Um, so I made a decision not to vote with it. But the general point is like um, it's the fear of non-European migration that has been central to that project. Just one interesting last point. When Tony Blair um, was trying to reverse Brexit, he wanted to play precisely to this dynamic by making an offer where he's saying all of Europe is terrified by these Muslim people and people from Africa and so on. If only we could get the whole of the European Union to clamp down more on uh, migrants coming from outside of Europe, uh, which it had already been doing, of course, but if only we could get even more repressive policies and even more dodgy deals with dodgy dictatorships in order to externalize the problem of migration, then we could strike a deal uh, where you know, white Christian and so on migration was allowed to continue and we would still have all the benefits of free trade within the European community. So Blair is there explicitly acknowledging this transition from the fear of the Eastern European to the fear of the, uh, the other coming from overseas. Thanks very much, James. So I've got a few more questions in the chat, which I'm very happy to read out. But, you know, I think everyone would prefer to see uh, your faces asking the questions rather than me reading them out. So I definitely encourage people to stick their hand up as well. But uh, here is another question from Mark. And Mark asks, um, the populist right is moving up uh, in countries like Italy. Uh, does James think that the Euro project, uh, European project is now under its greatest threat of other countries following Britain and leaving? Uh, but conversely, in America, we have a left centrist elected. Um, what, what, how do you explain this sort of political variation? So that's the first question. Um, then uh, a question from Alistair, and this is coming back to the question of Scotland. And Alistair says, the, S the Scottish National Party are in a quandary because while they get a lot of support from people who are supportive of remaining in the European Union, they face a whole set of problems in achieving EU membership. The question of currency uh, and new trade barriers with England, 
uh, and so on. So what form of independence would, in your opinion, be credible? Um, uh, and then I've got a question from Ronnie. Uh, does James feel there are any pr uh, there are, are any prospects of other countries doing a Brexit and leaving the EU? Is that uh, on the card? So in some in some ways, uh, some ways, a few interlinked questions there. Um, Italy is always a peculiar country. Um, I mean, any country with Silvio Berlusconi as its leader um, is always necessarily peculiar. Um, on the other hand, it's often said that Europe, uh, Italy is um, always the mark of where we're going in the future. Like it's a sort of like weird distorted uh, mirror into the future that we're all heading towards. And what you've had recently in Italy is this sort of fascinating techno populist uh, coalition emerging um, with a technocratic uh, leader. Um, but the populist five-star movement getting involved and so on, which is partly to do with their own crisis of legitimacy. I would argue that Italy continues to be sort of uh, marked by some of these very particular uh, dynamics that have been reflected in recent history, and obviously by a very charismatic uh, central leader um, of the populist right in Salvini. Um, it's always seemed like it might be the most likely of those to break uh, from the European uh, project, but Salvini has shown increasing reluctance in recent years to kind of emphasize that and very specifically um, ruled out uh, that he would ever again advocate leaving either the Eurozone or the European Union. One of the weird paradoxes, uh, the crazy paradoxes of Italian public opinion is that there are more people, there was at one stage more people opposed to uh, leaving the Eurozone than to leaving the uh, the European Union, and or, or put the opposite way, it would the, the prospect of leaving the uh, European Union was more popular than the prospect of leaving the single currency, despite all the terrible things that the single currency has done, um, which kind of tells you something, which is that the coercive power and the fear of going nationally bankrupt, and obviously Italy's had somewhat poor record of its own national currencies and so on in the past. Uh, the lira have in one stage been something of a byword for uh, poor currency management. Um, but many of these aspects are playing out. Um, I heard David Broder at one stage, uh, who was an expert on uh, Italian politics, saying maybe they just had to embrace the prospect of going bankrupt and just accept it if you wanted to have real national sovereignty returned. But uh, I mean, that is the kind of price that they're up against. Yes, uh, it makes a lot of logical sense to leave, perhaps, for them. Equally, it does raise the prospect of going bankrupt. That is the coercive force that you're basically up against. For most of those, we would be have the most motivation to leave. I mean, that's the paradox of it. Those who have the most motivation, who have been most, uh, had their economies most destroyed by the Eurozone or whatever it is, are also those who are in the least position to actually logistically engineer their exit out. I mean, Britain is a strange paradox in that sense because Britain had so many goodies offered to them by the European Union, like uh, they had payments and uh, they had, uh, you know, various different advantages and opt-outs that no one else probably would have been allowed and yet they were the ones to leave. Um, but it's also not entirely surprising. It's to do with power ultimately, and your ability to engineer events. So I hope that answers uh, Ronnie's question as well, and that I'm skeptical that others are going to leave, um, uh, which is not to say that there won't be persistent crises, because there's a lot about the project that's basically dysfunctional. Um, now, the question about what would be the most uh, viable or popular or legitimate um, mode of independence, um, I very much doubt that the idea of Scotland not being in the European Union would be entirely popular. But I think there's also an extent of which those of us who are progressive and believe in democracy and so on should nonetheless say that you can't just take the 2016 referendum as being consent um, for Scotland to be within the European Union that there should be another referendum um, on that question so that the, the matters can be debated properly. As I say, I mean, I think both ethically um, and democratically, uh, but also logistically, there are major problems 
uh, with being in the European Union that Scotland would have to encounter. It might well be that people prefer the benefits of the EU such as they are in that circumstance um, and also the values of the European Union uh, despite some of these drawbacks that I explained. But I just think that they haven't been properly explained to the Scottish people because of the very jaundiced way in which the debate was conducted in 2016 and its aftermath. Thanks very much, James. That's fantastic. OK, um, we've got a couple more questions coming in. So one from Lynn. Lynn says, on racialization, many uh, Eastern European countries have a history of internal racism against Roma, Jews and others. The sentiment seems to have been tapped into by their populist right governments and directed against non-Europeans. How important do you think this historical populist ideology has been. Uh, and Lee asks, why shouldn't Scotland join uh, EFTA and the EEA rather than the EU and emulate uh, a, a nation like Norway? So that's two questions for you. And I'm going to throw in a third. Um, uh, and this will be uh, the last question because we're coming close to time. Um, but you talk about these various interconnected stages of, uh, of crisis within the European project. It didn't seem like from your analysis that you think suddenly after the pandemic, everything's going to be resolved. Do you think that we are going to uh, enter another period of crisis? And if so, uh, what sort of things do you think have been exacerbated by the preceding crises? And, and on that basis, do you have any sort of expectations about what we might see? And alongside that, do you think the populist moment is receding or are we still in the heart of it? So sorry, I wanted to throw in a couple of questions for you at the end there as well. I'm afraid in the first question, um, it's largely uh, my friend and my boss and my co-author, uh, Umit Korkut, who's best placed to directly answer this because um, he's got the research experience in Eastern Europe uh, that I don't have. But what I can tell you is that his answer to your question would be a defiant yes, that it is very much rooted in the dynamics of the history that you have uh, suggested, uh, particularly most of his research um, is in Hungary. Um, and very much, uh, I think it's the legacy of, I don't know, I'm, my pronunciation of this may be wrong, but I think the Horthy uh, regime um, and its anti-Semitism and its attacks that you mentioned and so on, uh, that would be um, sort of re-emerging into uh, Hungarian consciousness, and in some cases being explicitly uh, promoted um, by elements of the uh, Hungarian government um, in a sort of re-education, Hungarianization sort of uh, programme. Pardon me, what was the second question again? So the second question was about uh, EFTA and the EEA. So oh, could Scotland yeah. just join them rather than the EU? I think that that is the direction that increasingly people will move towards. Um, or at least I think that's a dynamic that debate will be pitched at. From what I've heard, that is probably what, um, I mean, say what you want about this man. Um, but I believe that it might be the direction that the likes of Alex Salmond are moving towards, partly for some of the logistical and practical reasons that I've suggested. I don't think Salmond is really a critic of the EU for the reasons that I have outlined. But I think he's very conscious of defending Scotland's national interests and of the importance historically of the English uh, border being free and open and some of these other dynamics. So I think it, from what I've heard, the elements such as himself and others are moving towards this position that something like EFTA or something less onerous than the, the, the demands of the uh, European Union would be to Scotland's advantage. Um, and I think probably when it comes down to it, that's the way if we do move towards independence that the mainstream debate will play out. But I also think like in all of this, like part of what I've tried to articulate through all the lectures is that I think that even if these are the mainstream dynamics of the debate, sometimes the left needs to try to develop its own perspective also on some of these questions, even if it's a marginal one. Um, and at this stage, I think what we need to do is defend the maximum of democratic possibility for our governments and thereby our people to be able to influence trade and the economy and so on. All of these issues, I think, are exacerbated by the coronavirus, 
by the collapse again of uh, the institutions of globalization and of the assumptions that have held together uh, economic orders, uh, basically since the mid 1980s, if not before in the case um, of the United Kingdom. Um, so I think like uh, in all of these sorts of things, it's quite clear that in the economies of the future, growth in the sense that we used to think about it, growth as in uh, we'll have more openness, more globalization, that will make us more prosperous, that will create more tax revenues, then we'll become richer, then the next generation will be richer than the last and so on and so forth. I don't think it's going to continue to be there the same way that it was when I was growing up and Pete was growing up and so on, like uh, the booming 90s and all that sort of thing. I think we're in a period of general stagnation economically. And in that period, I think that the left should just accept that like what really matters in all of this is democratic control. Um, and democratic accountability of uh, politicians for as much of the economic decision making as possible. The last question, uh, what can I see emerging in terms of Europe's future and crises and so on? I mean, there are contradictory uh, signs as to whether the populist right is truly snuffed out. I mean, we can think of America where Donald Trump I forgot to answer an earlier question about this, so I'll just come on to this briefly. Obviously, it's the case that Donald Trump uh, did lose, but it was also actually a sign of the residual strength of the populist right in some ways, like because Donald Trump heroically mismanaged things, like heroically mismanaged the economy, heroically mismanaged the pandemic and its administration and so on. Nonetheless, you saw him, I, I believe this to be the case, to increase his vote with every group other than white males like uh, which was a somewhat surprising statistic on multiple levels. So in some ways, all of that's demonstrating that the weakness of the Biden campaign, um, although Biden has done some good things unexpectedly and breaking the habit of a lifetime, um, but uh, the weakness of the Biden campaign and the seeming residual strength of the populist right, that he could actually increase elements of his vote. Um, and there's also been some good polls um, over the piece for Marine Le Pen um, and for other figures of the populist right. So while there has been massive maladministration and uh, political errors by the populist right, it doesn't look like they're entirely down and out. Um, and it doesn't look like there is a sort of coherent narrative. I think the basic problem for the centrist managerial post politics that prevailed earlier is that they just cannot articulate a positive vision of the future anymore. Um, and really it's just constant day-to-day -day crisis management. Um, and into that vacuum, you're going to get the horrors of the populist left. Obviously my hope is that the situation that prevailed earlier um, that I talked about between 2009 and 2015, where the radical left really got its act together and was in some countries presenting a real alternative to these two narrow visions of Europe's future. My hope is that something like that is going to revive and uh, here's hoping. Thanks very much, James. I appreciated you ending on that potentially optimistic note. Uh, so listen, thank you so much. I uh, invite everyone to give a virtual round of applause to James uh, for joining us this week. Um, thank you again. I'd also like to uh, thank the co-sponsors of the event, the um, UW-Madison Department of Political Science, the uh, Jean Monet European Union Centre uh, of Excellence for Comparative Populism and Contour in Scotland. Uh, I'd also like to give one last plug for uh, some of the upcoming events that we have. Uh, next week, we have Donna Merch giving a talk uh, next Wednesday at the same time as this one on policing the crisis and the war on drugs. And then in the last week of April, we have a forum on housing justice that's being organized by Freedom Inc. You can find out more of those details on our website, havensrightcenter.edu. And I'd also say that if you have any further questions for James, 
games, I'm pretty sure that he'd be very happy to continue talking to uh, talking to you about all of the issues raised today and on Tuesday. So feel free to get in contact. If you contact us at the Havens Right Centre, we can put you in touch with him. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us um, and I'll see you all soon. Bye everyone.